Good morning, Guardian. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to Adam versus the Man. Starting off the show with some just cool news. And it's the only actual critical part of what's in the news today. I mean, there's today's kind of a fun day. We, we got a good grab bag of news. Hey, we got healthy disrespect for authority. Already join us first morning, folks. Uh, greets all for Mike Freeman. Yes, thank you very much for commenting on YouTube. The main destination still for Adam versus the Man Live Monday through Friday. 8 to 10 a.m. Pacific. So the good news. Good news. Like, okay, so I, 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 one of the things is the journalistic responsibility I take in, hey, if you're going to give me two hours a day, five days a week, I'm going to make sure nothing gets past you, right? That you're well informed because you know what's going on in global affairs to the best of my ability. And we have the Producers Club to help do that. And all the fans who watch, who email, who send us stuff, Thank you very much for all of that. I wish I had a better website to refer you to right now, but I am in the process still of rebuilding it myself. Very excited to get hands on with this. But you know what? Here's the thing that differentiates us from most news outlets that are trying to do that is they will try to sell you on. We have the news you need to know right now. And if you don't know, you might die. Be afraid. Be very afraid. And that's not just the mainstream media, right? Like that goes down to independent media too. And he's, I do want to tell you like, hey, if you're going to listen to some news outlet, you want to survive and you love life because I love life and I love life a lot more than, you know, being afraid. So we're not going to bring that to this show. And if you want to give people that content, this is like, hey, here's how to live the best life. Here's how to live the safest life. You can't always be playing this game of like, hey, if it bleeds, it leads. And you got to know this now and be afraid. A lot of independent media do that, too. So, um, happy Tuesday. There's nothing in the world right now that's like, you need to know this. It's happening right now. We're, no. No. And somebody's going to argue. Oh, no. There's an ad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's probably dozens of things that you'd be like, but, but I need to know about this right now. You know what? You know you need to know about right now? Our first story from the Washington Post, MSN.com. Blood Moon. Total lunar eclipse to dazzle Western U.S. on Wednesday morning. And as much as we like to think of, of this show as global in perspective, or at least in scope, we understand certainly an Amero-centric perspective. I don't pretend to deny my roots here. And I know that as, as much as we appreciate our global audience, and, and uh, Colette, I think, commented from, from, uh, from England, England, Britain, Great Britain, not so great Britain. So many confusing words. Uh, somewhere across the pond, Colette Allen, and we have friends who were helping cover uh, what's going on in Germany with uh, COVID lockdowns there. And from Australia, we've had fans in Asia. And I, I'm going back over the years, probably I, you know, most countries on the planet. Most? I don't know. Uh, if you count all the micro nations, probably we probably haven't covered most, but big, you know, big, the big, you know, official, yeah. Uh, so, uh, despite that, we do have a generally uh, American biased audience, at least for now. Um, and so that's why we're covering this from that perspective. But we don't definitely want to cover all of these. It's been a really fun thing in this format where I get two hours a day, five days a week. And we get to talk, we've been, you know, it, part of what I love about living off grid here, being in Gardenia, the very low light pollution area uh, is really, it, it's an amazing place to appreciate the night sky. And if you want to live well, if you want to survive, if you want to thrive, you know, being connected with nature every day, never give it in to, well, no, I have to know this now every day. I have to be informed. Not quite as important. So, blood moon, total lunar eclipse, to dazzle Western U.S. on Wednesday morning. If you glance skyward during the pre dawn hours Wednesday, and the moon is bathed in an eerie red glow, don't be alarmed. Parts of the Western U.S. will be treated to a total lunar eclipse early in the morning while sky watchers coast to coast can enjoy a bright full moon. And, and last night, even the, the almost full moon here. Incredible. Just stunning. You know, I, and and, and I, I, it never hurts, I don't think, to remind human beings of where we came from and this, the, the, the environment in which our, our minds 
developed and evolved pre-television i know pre-internet pre-smartphones oh, yeah I know, I know it's cliche but just take a second and remind yourself even even the idea of the night and the, the, the lunar cycle and i know this out here where you know we have we have like little solar path lights everywhere and on dark nights when the, when, when the, the when, or, you know before when the moon is set or before it's risen it's real dark. St stars are just beautiful and you can see planets and that you can look and t tell that's not a star that's a planet like the way it's it's not emanating light it's reflecting light there's something in in at least in my brain, even with my just okay vision, thanks to LASIK, that picks that up and you can see that and you can appreciate. But then most nights, and, and when, when there's good moonlight out, it's like it's a different world. We evolve to function in that world where sometimes the night is dark and full of terrors, and sometimes it's illuminated by the moon to a level that, I mean, here when there's a full moon, you walk around outside like it's daytime. I'm thinking like primitive human. You could have gone out and hunted last night. Yeah, like it was so and, bright. You could see everything. It was incredible. And and that's not even conscientiously letting your eyes adjust, right, Joey? That's just walking outside and walking, oh, wow, yeah. But if you you know, really got in tune with that, and I'm not a Luddite, and I'm not a primitivist. I'm a technologist. I'm a futurist. I'm a transhumanist. But I just... I know that right now where we are, there's an incredible value for human life and experiencing that kind of connection with nature and, and celestial observations being merely one aspect of that. But even as we, as, as I, as I fantasize about having a Neuralink chip in my brain controlling a, you know, molecular 3d printer on my fingertip, that can rearrange the molecules in thin air and turn me into a fucking wizard. I hope I never forget that the, the, the will, whatever it is in me that is my human will is still not hardware or software, but biological wetware that is a product of this earth, of this experience of human history thus far that has gotten us to this beautiful point of standing on the precipice of so much progress. And I'm sorry if I missed any of those great comments, Ed. That's my producer note for the day. Look for the full moon. Look for the blood moon. Look for what's happening in your area, especially if you're in the Western U.S. And with that, producer Jim Freedom, give us your producer notes. Okay, sorry. Backstage stuff got a lot going on. I was a little, I'm a few seconds behind us today. Uh, we got a few things to share with our promos and a few, uh, a few things I wanted to make sure to mention, like our uh, new account, some of the new accounts we have, one of them being our LinkedIn branching out to beat the censorship. So that's awesome. We've been having good, uh, good progress with that. So get connected on LinkedIn with us there. What, what are, are we streaming on LinkedIn? Is that? We will uh, be. I don't, like, yeah, we will be once we figure that out. But we're just we're we're connected now, and people are starting to find us there and reach us there. And, uh, five, and we published our welcome blog or welcome back blog there yesterday, right? And I that's I, I for me it was like okay LinkedIn, you know it's a serious website. There's a serious community there, business oriented social media, but not really social media. It is social media in function. But it's it's business social media. It's a conversation tailored around business. That's not what we're doing. Like, yes, I talk about plenty of stuff that we do that's relevant that intersects. And I want to have a presence there as a business representing Adam versus the man, representing big igloo geodesics, representing eventually Homefront Battle Buddies, as well as businesses in that networking social media context. But I didn't expect that just cleaning up our presence and posting a blog would get like buzz on LinkedIn. But apparently, yeah pretty cool so yeah. uh it's the linkedin community I, I i hope some of you are are joining us this morning yeah yeah definitely uh i wanted to bring up mela spencer said adam this is the first time i've seen you on my linkedin feed also mm -hmm. yes i will follow you wherever you broadcast also as a former texan on behalf of all who suffer there 
I am very sorry about what happened there after you after your announcement to run for president. Unfortunately, it sounds like your issues are off the same branch as those that caused my to me to seek sanity in my current location. So I say to you, document it all. No matter how small it seems, it will make a huge difference on many levels. Good luck and never quit. Your cause is just and worthy of the fight. Wow. Very, Thank you, very Nathan. cool. Thank you, sir. Who, who was that? Uh, Mela, I just closed it. So Mela, for... <laughs> all right. Well, thank Mela. I think it was. Uh, yeah, that was very, very cool and very thoughtful. So I thought I'd get that out there. Uh, other ways you can support the show. You're going to be able to go to adamversusdemand.com very soon, and it's going to give you everything you need. It's got a link to our Patreon. It's got one and five and ten and fifty dollars a month is the different levels to support the show. Ten dollars a month will get you access to the producers club, the private producers club, which I already forgot to mention. The public telegram channel before that you can join that at t.me forward slash adam versus the man but if you want to be cool to the next level and be in the private producers club you can earn that through the ten dollars a month on patreon and once you do that you can visit the adam versus the man store and all your merch is going to be 15 percent off and free shipping for those uh patrons so ch definitely check that out take advantage of it after that there will also be a link in our sponsors allies tab that's going to bring you to the Cigar Federation to check out cigarfederation.com. You can check out their cigars and use promo code Adam one zero there and you'll get 10% off your entire order. Definitely a great website for cigars. If you're into that, definitely check that out and take advantage of that promotion. Uh, Instagram, we post some new stuff all the time with what's going on with Adam up there in Gardenia, how life is going with freedom land. Uh, definitely check out Instagram at the garden of freedom and click on all the pictures and videos of all the crazy cool stuff going on up there. Instagram at the Garden of Freedom. Uh, the Crypto Six, we're still talking about that because it's still relevant because those guys are still in the situation. Ian Freeman was released to his home confinement, but he is still in trouble with the law, with the people that are trying to punish him <laughs> for his victimless actions. Down. Yeah, the He's man is still on, attacking. On papers. Right, he loosened <clears throat> the noose a little bit, but they are still trying to hang the guy. So he needs help. Go to the crypto6.com and do what you can to look into that and help them out. Were you about to say something else? Go ahead before I go next. Yeah, I, I, I want to underscore this just as a reminder, covered this thoroughly yesterday, but that we are living through a reduction in the brutality of the police state melting or thawing, maybe not melting away yet, but thawing significantly under the intense heat of the technology driven scrutiny. And one of the ways that is manifest is in this case with Ian Freeman, that with uh, the nature of these alleged non crimes, because they're not even alleging that he has a victim other than not paying off government, they are not able to use that as an excuse to keep him confined. And that is huge. So celebrate that, appreciate that. I think we should all uh, take some credit for that, you know, with what like we do on the show, promoting the crypto. And people I've, I've met like at the California convention one, I was trying to help someone at the last minute, we didn't get to it on the agenda, but to pass a resolution in support of the crypto six and just a one sentence, you know, we support everybody and especially them who are, you know, subject to persecution for victimless crimes and fighting right. back on behalf of setting a precedent. And uh, they were, you know, a lot of people were saying, how come more people aren't talking about this? But at least those of us who have, have made sure that there's a certain spotlight on their cases and a level of, of self-consciousness, I, 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 for lack of a more precise term, perhaps, in the minds of all the government agents involved in this case. We have done that. We did right. that. You know, everybody, hey, we brought enough of a spotlight to that. And all of the cases leading up to this point, most notably George Floyd recently, obviously, that has gotten to this level of, of I, I would say, uh, the brutality is lessening. I don't want to say the police state is going away yet, but it is thawing and it is soon to melt into at least a new form that is, is much less brutal. And, and this is just, I, I mm, every chance I get, I'm going to be pointing this out because right now, it's uh, I think it's the most positive dynamic in human in, in, in American history unfolding. Well said. Well said. OK, so with that said, uh, lastly, our last promotion is.
gogreenenergyonline.com. Uh, it's an absolutely great website if you're thinking about doing it yourself to try to get yourself off grid or on solar energy, micro wind energy, zero energy homes. This is a great website for all your information uh, to help you do that. So gogreenenergyonline.com. Give them a check out. Give them a visit and uh, support them. All right. Yeah. And with that, Co-host Ed Vallejo joins us from the other side of Gardenia City, Gardenia, uh, from the uh, safety wagon, one of the old Freedom Trailer, Freedom Mobile, repurposed vehicle, now functional thanks to his efforts. Ed, it's great to see you. Before anything else, I want to give you a chance to tease our guests, Louis Marinelli and Justin O'Donnell, since you booked them today. Okay. Um <laughs> yeah, Ed, Ed, Ed scrambled to get into position. Well, literally dry, scra drove, ran, dove, scrambled through the dirt, through the briars and the brambles to get to the Freedom Trailer this morning. Uh, so, I, I set a land speed record on that dirt road coming from the water tank, Adam. <laughs> what you do with that little truck always surprises me. You are really a master of squeezing performance out of that thing. This morning, I come to you from Freedom Farm with <laughs> oh, Lucky the Shop Cow. All right, and I, <laughs> oh, look at that. Um, I, I actually am uh, excited for personal reasons with both of these guests. Uh, Louis Marinelli is also uh, on my, uh, or uh, a fellow member of the Cadillacs at Congress, the California Independence Movement Board of Directors. Uh, shouldn't say movement board, the organization board, obviously. Uh, movements don't get to have boards of directors. Organizations do. And remember, no one ever built a monument to a committee. But Louis Marinelli is the Calix at Congress uh, uh, candidate for governor in California, running on the platform of breaking off. And kind of interesting because I have two other friends running for governor of California uh, in this in this special election. Uh, uh, our friend Nick Wildstar, formerly of the Libertarian Party, playing the Republican angle in this race, and Jeff Hewitt, uh, a Libertarian uh, county supervisor in Riverside, technically, uh, I think even more so than uh, uh, a, a member, our, our members of legis state legislatures, because he, he has a higher, he has more constituency and oversees more of a budget proportionally with his authority as a supervisor in, uh, in Riverside County. But anyway, there is Louis Marinelli. He's going to be joining us today as the Cal exit candidate. And it, it's, it's pretty cool that, to me, the Freedom Cause has three solid candidates running on three different angles that are sort of not competing with each other. You know, right. um, Nick Wildstar is going to be, you know, hey, if the Republicans are going to get around a candidate, let's get the Republicans around a Liberty candidate. Okay. He's black. He's, he, he doesn't have dreads anymore. He cut his hair short, but he had dreads. He's a tall dude. He's an imposing dude. He represents, he plays the race card well. Uh, so being that, the, you know, the black Republican governor candidate in the California recall election, that's a pretty cool lane, you know, pretty cool angle. Jeff Hewitt as a, an elected libertarian, you know, running on what some would say is a moderate libertarian platform. I think he would say about Cal Exit that uh, he'd be happy to put it to a vote of the residents when they, when they say that they're ready for it, right, and would support uh, and th that move. When the people are ready, I, I I don't mean to put words in his mouth, but in that sense, on the spectrum, the moderate, right? And then you have Louis Marinelli, our guest today, running kind of exclusively single issue platform. We've seen this before, right? On California Independent, so uh, that's pretty exciting. And then uh, Justin O'Donnell, perennial libertarian candidate and party activist out of New Hampshire, speaking specifically about the Quill, which is. Uh, a facility, uh, the, the the Libertarian Clubhouse in Manchester. It's a very cool facility. Have you been there, Ed? No. So you, but you know it by reputation, right? Yes, I've heard. Yeah. It. Okay. So they're they're in uh, I, I, save the quill fundraising mode, um, but it's not like it's it's an interesting story. It's not like oh my god, they're about to demolish or kick him out. 
it's actually really like save the quill and help it level up. And it's pretty cool to see that this uh, institution of the freedom movement and the free state project in New Hampshire might get a little bit more entrenched with this effort. Well, Adam, I, I got to thank you for the easy money here, man, because so far as your guest scheduler, you've been throwing people at me and I've been getting the right on them and they've been saying yes. And it's they're just falling into place. Where <laughs> I really don't have to do much, but just coordinate it. Yeah. Yeah. I, when I have a reliable scheduler, uh, I, I, I got a pretty interesting Rolodex. We're going to need your help and we're going to need the audience's help as we get now in this more organized consistent format with guests leveling up. I mean, I think if, if I had to, if I had to say off the top of my head, I think Roger Stone was our highest profile guest of the last year. Um, Joe Jorgensen uh, right up there as, as the nominee, at least, um, right. you know, we want to have more guests of, of that caliber, at least right off the bat. Of so get your requests and your opportunities. And what? at thefreedomline.com. Right. And he's doing a great job already. Great. I, I'm we started strong with yesterday with John Brakey. That was a great interview. It really was. Yeah. I I liked it. His uh, background game. Yeah. I, I mean, his we, background game. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. That was amazing. I, I mean, I'm kind of like, shit, I want to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah, that's so cool. He was able to plug into StreamYard as a guest and do his own green screen. And control his slides like ah, as he was, he was doing the interview like wow the real life powerpoint it was incredible. yeah yeah no but behind him it was a real life powerpoint on a group where he we were able, and he was able to be like oh well, right here on this thing I'm like, you know like that was it was yeah mind blown i don't know if i ever um want to have to get to that level but we will we will have that capability as we grow out and uh you know develop the studio here we're, we're like we're we're, we're we're this close no, no we right now i got my orderly screen man <laughs> <laughs> well i put up i put up uh 99 yesterday right or day before for starlink so we gave it we'll give elon musk money for that we might have starlink internet out here Okay. Mid to late 2021. <laughs> well, speaking of getting the audience more involved, today's contest is suggest a comment contest. <laughs> the best comment contest will win entrance in, and 90% of the suggestions will be stolen, guaranteed. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm surprised it took us this long with co-hosts doing comment contests to get so perfectly meta on this one. But yes, the comment contest has come up with the best comment contest and we'll be writing down and recycling your ideas in the future. <laughs> All right, Ed, keep the comments coming. Keep them going on stream. Uh, we're gonna have some fun today. But first we, we gotta kick off our news block, uh, international news with a serious story. All right, classical music comment contest for euphemisms for double speed. Best euphemism. See, now people are going to want to play gonna know what euphemism every means. contest. Okay, <laughs> no, okay, but no euphemism. Um, I mean, a, 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 a coded, almost vernacular term to obscure the true meaning of something, right? Good definition. Um, like you use euphemisms for sex around kids to obscure that you're talking about sex, right? Um, instead of saying, we're fucking, say we're, we're making the beast with two backs. And, and you go, oh, yes, and ch children aren't going to know what you're talking about. No That's an example of you. <laughs> I'm going to be a terrible parent or a great parent. I don't know. Uh, yeah. uh, that's an example of you. Uh, euphemisms would be good. So if I see now, I want to do all these comic contests. Like, we're going to have 100 comic contests. I'm like, what do you mean comic contests? Stupid shit, Anthony Ralston. <laughs> oh, little, little producer club rivalry happening with the ghost girl already. All right, into this serious news story. We go first to the Communist News Network, that ever so serious outlet of journalism. Actually, I do think I do think they're getting this one uh, mostly right. Although there may be some major, and, and, and we're, you know, one of the things we're doing every day is reading the news with that skepticism. So CNN detained Belarusian dissident appears in video as fury mounts over hijacking of Ryanair flight. Yeah, 
Do we we mentioned the story yesterday, and I told you we be coming back. Well, we're coming right back because the the, uh, the 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 new development with this video uh, is very interesting, and the international reaction and lack thereof also. And we'll see. It hasn't been very long. I mean, it'll be like 24, 48 hours, something since this has happened. So maybe it's a little early, but there's so many fascinating intersections with, with this story. Dissident journalist Roman Protasevich has appeared in a new video. I hope I'm saying it right. Normally I'm just like, yeah, whatever. You know, it's a lot of syllables. And, no, but uh, Protasevich, you're going to know this name. This is, like, this, is, this is one of those stories like, we're, I, I, I hope I'm saying it right, because if I'm saying it wrong, I'm going to be saying it right tomorrow going, sorry, because we're going to be saying this name a lot. I, I mean, it's prediction. Like, this is uh, what just happened. Uh, and, 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 you know, like I said, at the beginning, there's nothing you need to know. With that. You know, this is this is the need to know. It's not like an urgent thing, but this is like, yeah. And, and, and this is one of those stories where the American media goes, funny sounding name, Europe complicated plot line government making things more complicated we don't know who to trust so this is a hard story to report on so we're probably not going to i i there's a lot of that i'm seeing in the lack of or attitude and coverage towards this because you know hijacking like this is some tin pot dictator shit with a budget in Europe that has a lot of other intersections too with American politics and foreign aid and American intervention in the past several decades in this area. So here we go. Uh, dissident journalist Roman Protasevich has appeared in a new video after his arrest by Belarusian authorities on Sunday following the government's extraordinary diversion of his Ryanair flight to capital city Minsk. The video, the first since Protasevich's arrest, comes amid mounting fears for his safety and widespread fury over the diversion of a European commercial flight. The attitude of the Interior Ministry employees towards me has been as correct as possible in compliance with the law, Protasevich says in the video, which is posted Monday evening to a pro-government social media channel. Quote also, I continue to cooperate with the investigation and have confessed to organizing mass riots in the city of Minsk. This is where I believe the video was made under duress. And I, it, it would certainly seem this way. And I, one of the reasons I think this story is not just so important uh, in and of itself, but as a sign of the times and for the ramifications, uh, this is after the murder and you know, disappearance murder of Khashoggi uh, at the hands of the Saudi Arabian government. The Belarusian government doing this fucked up, frankly. And uh, in doing so, uh, they, they've, they are calling and, and have created a rallying cry for a lot of people to call attention to this man's story and the stories that he was calling attention to and what he was doing. <clears throat> but also this larger issue that until this, I didn't know about. Oh, but you do something dramatic and, you know, hijack a plane. You did. You did. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be air quoting that. You hijacked a plane. This is military escort hijacked a plane. But you're not, you're not an escort at that point. You're forcing a landing. That's a hijack, Right. It was politically motivated hijacking to extract a single political prisoner. As we learn more about this story and background, we'll be able to better analyze, discuss, label, and come up with a narrative around this that makes it easy for us to, to see the implications and to fit into a bigger global analysis. But even right now, you can tell this is a very important story. Protasevich is one of dozens of Belarusian journalists and activists campaigning in exile against Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko's 26-year rule. Uh, Colette Allen, the thing is, how did they know he was on that particular flight? Thank you for weighing in from Facebook, Colette. Uh, really? You're, how, did, how did that big modern government know? Uh, how were they? Really? <laughs> that all, of, that all governments that are like of that size have some <laughs> intelligence apparatus to track citizens. And they're sharing information 
it's not hard. I mean, it's like we live in this world, and hey, this, this, it's a double-edged sword of, of that information, that tracking, that uh, that ability. I think it, you know, it's overall a good thing. Yes, it allows governments to to track you, but uh, it, it empowers so many other positive technologies. Where I do think the benefits still with in a world with government outside the downsides. But hey, get rid of government, get rid of the downsides and the fear about that technology, especially before we get AI here, right? Classical music, smash the like button. Yes, thank you for those of you watching on YouTube. If it's not still futile to get us up in the algorithms, you can throw us some super chats too. So <clears throat> uh, back to uh, Protasevich. He is the founder of the Telegram channel Nexta, which helped mobilize anti-Lukashenko protests and was charged last year with organizing mass riots and group actions that grossly violate public order. He is on the government wanted list for terrorism. The 26-year-old dissident was traveling on Ryanair flight 4978 from Athens, Greece to Vilnius, Lithuania on Sunday when shortly before the touchdown, before touchdown, the plane was diverted by Belarusian air traffic control to the capital Minsk. A Minsk over a supposed security alert. You go, oh, really? Ryanair CEO Michael O'Leary accused Belarus of state-sponsored piracy. Yeah, telling Ireland's News Talk Radio Monday that he believed Belarusian KGB agents were also on the flight that was carrying 26-year-old Protasevich, who was wanted in Belarus on a variety of charges. All, of course, victimless crimes. To my knowledge, uh, they haven't even tried to fabricate something like the, like Julian Assange's rape crime against this guy. Really, uh, state-sponsored piracy. And one of the reasons I think this is such a good story and, and, and a positive one that is going to be an accelerant of positive change is the kind of uh, international accountability now, standards being applied. As governments are brought under more scrutiny with technology, we get to compare them to each other as well. You go, hey, how come you guys are doing this and they're not? I, we, you, they, no, you shouldn't do that. And eventually it's going to be violate the non-aggression principle at all. This, this is an accelerating march towards a voluntary society. I hope it's not a stretch to see it as connected to that. Similarly, Irish Foreign Minister Simon Coveney said that Secret Service agents may have been on the plane telling national broadcaster RTE that the agents were clearly linked to the Belarusian regime. Uh, as he added, quote, when the plane landed, either five or six people didn't reboard the plane before it took off again, but only one or two people were actually arrested, so it certainly would suggest that a number of the other people who left the plane were Secret Service. So many disgusting violations to make this possible and to remember, motivated by a desire to silence dissent. This is what the American government is paying for. This is your, your tax dollars subsidizing foreign governments. Far worse, crazier shit than this. And here's the thing. This isn't like this is the tip of the iceberg. This isn't like an isolated incident either, except in the sense that it's the one that snuck out. This is something that is happening all over the world every day. Silencing of dissidents through gross rights violations, even under inhumane laws. This one is the one where they went too far and got caught by the international community. Because now other governments, in order to maintain their credibility, have to condemn this and have to do something about it. This story is going to be with us until it unfolds and comes to its conclusion. The legal trial of Roman Protasevich, this, this episode of his life, is of profound global implications. The story uh, goes on. Belarus borders three European Union member states, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, and EU leaders were discussing further action against Lukashenko's government on Monday with global leaders calling on airlines to avoid Belarusian airspace, their citizens to leave the country, and for the opposition activists' release. Patrick from Across Gardenia also weighs in. The use of intimidation or violence in the pursuit of political or monetary gains 
Is Webster's definition of terrorism, government calling it an a bomb threat to force a plane down is terrorism. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, one way or another, it's terrorism. Uh, Fedor Shinkarenko joined states. Activities are recognized as sovereign and thus legitimized by other sovereign states. Well, the limits of what governments are able to tolerate from other governments on the global stage while maintaining their own credibility. It's changing. And for the better. So, fears of torture, abuse, as the world turns its focus to Belarus, Protasevich's supporters are calling foul on Lukashenko's tactics. Critics of the Belarusian strongman, including exiled opposition leader Sviatlana, oh, I'm really going to screw up this name, Tsikhanouskaya said that the video released on Monday appeared to be filmed under duress. Quote, as she said on, on Twitter, this is how Roman looks under physical and moral pressure. The video also comes as Protasevich's father, Dmitry Protasevich, told CNN on Monday that he hears his son faces torture and physical abuse at the hands of Belarusian authorities. Now, why? Why? Why would? Why would he fear? Do governments do that? Do good, kind governments do that? Robbie, who grants the state's authority now, does a fictional entity grant immunity? Indeed, our next headline from the Daily Mail illuminates what Protasevich may be facing. Inside Lukashenko's brutal torture chambers, the Belarus detention centers where protesters are beaten until they pass out, starve, deprived of sleep, and forced to sign confessions in bestial conditions. Dissident journalist Protasevich has been tortured, according to his allies. Last night he confessed. Quote, After his Ryanair flight was hijacked over Belarus, his own news channel had informed the world of torture chambers last year. What a world we live in. Tell the rest of the world that someone is operating in torture chamber and you might just find yourself in it. Screams of the victims could be heard coming from prisons in the night. Hundreds were arrested and subjected to merciless beatings, suffering broken bones, brain trauma, electrical burns, kidney damage, and smashed teeth. Now this sounds a little sensationalistic for a modern government. Is it true? I don't know. Part of me is Skeptical in the sense that perhaps there's some 4D global chess game afoot where the demonization of Lukashenko at this particular moment in time is part of the game. Do I defend him? Absolutely not. Lukashenko is certainly guilty enough from what I know to be true at least that the punishment of being misrepresented as a torturer would be a small, small toll to exact for his crimes. But let us not forget that there are bigger forces at work in the institution that is the government of Belarus is really small compared to the power of the government of, say, Israel, England, even Germany, the United States, certainly. And it makes you wonder if the United States government is a servant of the banking class, the corporate class, the new technocracy, Who's really pulling the string? See, who's really pulling the strings in Belarus? Who is really driving what's going on in this case with Protasevich? Lukashenko, as evil as he might be, isn't dumb. And this whole thing seems really dumb. Really? To get one dissident journalist organizer, you're going to put a jet in the air and hijack an airplane. Come on, this you know, this is a, a modern security state apparatus we're talking about here in Belarus. This isn't this isn't uh, some podunk microstate like Gardenia. You know they have all of the shadows in their government that allow them to hide the evils of making people disappear. 
or die by heart attack or in a vehicle accident. Why? Why hijack a plane? Someone said, we have to get this guy. Well, I can think of a way. We're just going to hijack a plane. Did no one in the Belarus government go, hey, you know what? Can we do this in a slightly more subtle way than hijacking a plane? No, even that doesn't add up. And for the governments that are now springing into action in defense of this decision, journalist, not that he doesn't deserve it, we must remain aware that there are much greater forces at play here. Nothing on the internet is real. And in this case, I am very confident that whatever version the public is getting through the mainstream media is only a distorted version of the truth at best. Regardless, what's out there already makes this an historically important story. Also from the Washington Post at msn.com, opinions from Felipe de la Hoz, El Salvador's leaders updating the autocrat playbook for the TikTok generation. Sounds really cool, right? Salvadoran President Nayib Bukele has worked very fast since he took office in 2019. He promised infrastructure development, tourist dollars, and an environment ripe for direct foreign investment. U.S. officials were delighted with his commitment to reducing out-migration, which has become the preeminent foreign policy goal in the region through a focus on domestic job creation. The honeymoon came to a terse end less than a year later when Bugele, frustrated by the Salvadoran legislature's refusal to quickly approve a substantial loan supplement to his already record-breaking budget, security budget, marched troops into the assembly chambers. He and the troops left without incident. The spell had been broken. So, the 39-year-old has leaned into the irre irreverent tough guy image and he was rewarded rewarded for it in March as the Salvadoran public delivered a landslide victory for his newly founded New Ideas Party. The victory enabled his most alarming power move, the dismissal of all five justices of the country's constitutional court this month. Bukele start, stared down the one remaining governmental entity that could act as a check on his power, and he won, leaving nothing standing in the way of his authority. All right. Welcome to the new El Salvador. Now, in more interesting international news of intersections with American celebrity, we go to France24.com. Fast and Furious star Cena apologizes for calling Taiwan a country. He's not a WWE celebrity anymore. Now he's Fast and Furious. How'd that happen? John Cena has successfully made the leap to mainstream Hollywood celebrity. Is that what this headline should read, Joey? Okay, hold on. No, I don't care about that. I don't get John Cena, big American tough guy, celebrity, WWE, making movies, doing good, right? Doing very well for himself and following the Rock's footsteps. Fast and Furious 9 star John Cena made a U-turn Tuesday apologizing to Chinese fans after he called Taiwan a country and sparked outrage in the world's largest moving market. Beijing sees democratic self-ruled Taiwan as part of its territory, which is to be seized one day by force if necessary, and rages at any diplomatic attempts to recognize the island as an independent nation. Now, there's so many interesting intersections with the story, but just to make this clear, like to, to give you like a proxy with the uh, American experience. This would be like London trying to control people's speech in the rest of the world after the Revolutionary War, saying, how dare you call them the United States of, the, of America? Those are the British colonies. But then seeing and, just back down from it so easy? And, and getting away with it. That's the power of the Chinese bullying manipulation of speech. It, this and and you know what? I'll I'll say to John Cena, really, this is this you should be ashamed. This is cowardly. Real because Taiwan is an independent nation, fairly well established and recognized as such. Having broken away from China's violent rule. 
China is now trying to expand its imperial reach. Look at Tibet. Look at Hong Kong. And now, with its successful move into squashing democracy in Hong Kong, China's been making moves to do the same to Taiwan. And for John Cena to, to buckle, it's, you know what it is? And it says it right here. Why, why did he do it, Joey? Why? What, what does it take? What does it take to be a Hollywood celebrity in America? You have to kiss ass to the world's largest movie market. See, this makes sense why they didn't mention WWE. <laughs> no. And even this story, even this this whole story, and I, and I wonder if it's, hey, let, uh, it's, I, a lot of these Hollywood news stories are very deliberately planted and manipulated. They always have been. So and so got married, divorced, had a kid, blah, blah, all the all the celebrity gossip you want to just plan it. I did design it, put butts in seats, sell movie tickets, right? So, John Cena, when given the choice to side between the rebellion or the empire, said, sign me up, Vader. Let's do this. Taiwan's not a country. China, Xi Jinping, it's your territory, sir. Yes, China's a country. Yes, we bow down. I am John Cena. I am a sellout and a coward. Uh, yeah. But American wrestling star turned actor Cena left his diplomatic lane during a trip to Taiwan in early May to promote the franchise of action movies about fast cars, making the country comment during a fan meet. On Tuesday, his outrage billowed across China's social media. And I'm already there, I go, really? But <laughs> you mean after Chinese government trolls went, wow! They not see that that like now the thing is I'm not saying that that doesn't represent a real threat to the movie market, but it's not because the people in China go, oh how dare how dare that one star not understand Chinese Taiwanese politics? <laughs> We're not going to watch this dumb movie about fast cars now. <laughs> no, but if the government goes, let's let's make this false outrage happen on on Weibo and other whatever things social media within the Great Firewall of China. They can also go, well, we're going to just pull your movie from the theaters or say, fuck you and fuck your business, right? Uh, on Tuesday, his outrage billowed across China's social media. He released an apology on the Weibo platform in conversational level Mandarin. I did many, many interviews for Fast, this is the quote, I did many, many interviews for Fast and Furious 9, and I made a mistake during one interview. Cena said in the video, without repeating the controversial term. Yeah. Just, I made a mistake. It's like if Aleppo had blown up like Gen this, yeah. right? Genuinely, you know, situation genuinely up, really. trying to just back off. I must say, here's a quote. I must say, which is very important, that I love and respect China and Chinese people. I'm very, very sorry for my mistake. I apologize. You know, loving and respect someone, loving and respecting someone isn't Oh, you want to be an empire and, and enslave other people and bring them in under the control of your central authority? Well, I love and respect you. Really, John? Are you that you're not dumb? I John Cena is not dumb. Like a lot of people, oh, he's dumb. He's, no, he's not. You don't get to that level of like it's competitive. I mean, even to be a WWE star, those guys aren't just meatheads. They are like serious. I'll say performance athletes. It's not, it's not athletic contest, it's not real sports. They are performance athletes, and it, and, and, and it, is, it is a dumb product. Wrestling, Professional wrestling is a dumb media product that no one should consume. It makes you dumber, okay? And, but it's competitive. You don't get to that level of performance and celebrity and his success as an actor without being pretty fucking smart. John Cena knows what he's doing here. He's not making mistakes. He's not being controlled by handlers. He is a knowing, willing sellout who was chosen to take in the side of the empire against people who want to be free of it in Taiwan. And right now, with all the geopolitical maneuvering and China actually actively working to retake Taiwan by force if necessary, this kind of selling out has consequences, implications. John Cena is not dumb. He knows that 
Freedom will suffer. Quality of life will suffer and possibly people will die because China gets away with this kind of control of the conversation. Maybe even getting people like you, John Cena, to sell out like this. The video was played 2.4 million times on a strictly controlled social media site while Chinese media left on the apology. You know what? If, if anything, John Cena, you know, in, instead of taking a stand, he's being used because the Chinese government goes, hey, America, I see your sellout propaganda piece there. Can we borrow that for a second? Can we get, can we get a video from a mainstream American celebrity telling the Chinese people that, that we are righteous in claiming Taiwan as our territory? Thank you, America. Thank you, John Cena. Thank, thank you. You have, you have served the empire. Oh, yeah, good, good little celebrity. Fast and Furious 9 smashed through the box office during its May 21 release in China last weekend, raking in $148 million. Uh, social media users ap appeared only partially appeased. And then and th this is where like you go, these, these aren't organic comments anyway. Please say Taiwan is part of China in Chinese or we won't accept it. That one Weibo handle while another lamented the Americans' apparent lack of knowledge that Taiwan is an integral part of China. China's vast consumer market has in recent years been weaponized against critics of Beijing entities, including the NBA and global fashion giants that face boycotts and a battering on social media for speaking out on rights abuses or political issues China deems off limits. And then there's John Cena. Wall Street Journal. We've only got uh, a few minutes before we get to our guests. Going to have to skim through some more of these headlines. Wall Street Journal. Dozens of Mexican candidates have been killed in a bloody election season. Mexico's crime gangs looking to control local territory are gunning down politicians who resist. Abel Murrieta, a candidate for mayor in the northern city of Ciudad Obregón, was handing out flyers on a crowded street corner on May 13. Music played from loudspeakers. He smiled and chatted with passersby. Suddenly, two men approached and shot him 10 times in the face, neck and chest, police say. As the 58-year-old lawyer and former state prosecutor lay dying, his killers walked off calmly and terrified by Sanders scurried for cover. And it is worth reminding ourselves that while as privileged citizens of the empire here in the United States, we are lucky to live in a place where this kind of violence is not rampant. It is a product of exporting the drug war that leads to this kind of violence where Good men standing up to run for office to try to do the right thing face this kind of threat. And I am, I am uh, just glad I don't live in Mexico. I'd rather be here as a protected citizen of the empire for my own selfish reasons. But here's, uh, you know, in loving memory to those who are standing up righteously and facing that violence in Mexico. Aunt Ralston on YouTube, best common contest, best excuse for starting insurrection. I like that. Isn't that what we do on the show every day? Yahoo.com with LA Times story, armed drones crisscross Middle Eastern skies, bring havoc and a new threat to U.S. And I just, I, I just saw this headline. I was like, well, they're not armed drones when we do it. They're UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles that don't bomb wedding parties. They have collateral damage when they surgically take out insurgents and terrorists. Oh my gosh, and this is like, holy shit, the opposition is getting drone technology too. Yeah, no shit. Uh, but yeah, that's the thing. Uh, Gaza and, and the resistance there using drones with Hamas, uh, insurgents and, and other areas in the Middle East and Yemen. Yeah, and, and even in Mexico, we've seen cartels. Using drones. So yeah. Associated Press with our next headline from John Gamble, mysterious air base being built on volcanic island off Yemen. And this is really weird. This is a really crazy story. A mysterious air base is being built on a volcanic island off Yemen that sits in one of the world's crucial maritime choke points for both energy shipments and commercial cargo. Well, no country has claimed the Mine Island Air Base in the Bab el Mandeb Strait shipping traffic associated with the prior attempt to build a massive runway across the three and a half mile long island years ago links back to the United Arab Emirates. Officials in Yemen's internationally recognized government now say the Emiratis are behind this latest, I like, Emiratis. We are the Emiratis. If you say it with an Arabic accent, you can make it sound really scary, too. You, you can tell it, we are! Well, 
I'll stop. I, that's getting <laughs> racist, isn't it? I love the Arab accent. No. I love. I love. I'm just. It's. I love the sound. And I'm making fun of how people react. To it. Like I. I actually love. I, I'm. I'm thinking of that Tom Segura bit we we're listening to, yesterday, where the where Tom asks for change and he pulls out an attaché <laughs> with one. Of, I have one of everything. Here is the money for your pussy drink. <laughs> <laughs> that's how to use an Arab accent. Like, it sounded um, nothing like an Arab accent. Yeah. Try it. <laughs> Here is some money for your pussy drink. <laughs> that's better. Okay. Thank you. I'm, see, I'm not doing an Arab impersonation of an Arabic man. I'm doing an, Arab, an impersonation of Tom Segura. I'm doing an impersonation of an Arabic man who eat at least whatever. Uh, no, coffee okay. shop. Dumb joke. But yeah, so there's, a, there's there's a new airbase on an island that is like mysterious. You can in 2021, you can still have a mysterious island airbase. We'll see if it comes into tactical relevance. Deseret.com, Deseret News. Are children dying like dogs in effort to build better batteries? Yeah. And one of the things um I mean, kind of hate to say I told you so because I've been talking about this for years and it's not really an original observation, but that I, as we get to alternative energy, the kind of demand and corruption and criminality that we've seen around the energy industry and the oil and gas uh, is, is going to go to rare earth minerals, things that go to create the machines, the technology, the batteries. And now it's, it's already at this point with the surge in batteries in Congo, uh, the demand for cobalt is, is so high that it is causing what they allege is uh, Microsoft and Tesla and Dell profiting off the misery of child labor in their quest for cobalt. As uh, the lawsuit against them reads, cobalt is a key component of every rechargeable lithium ion battery and all of the gadgets made by defendants and all other tech and electric car companies in the world that has brought on the latest wave of cruel exploitation fueled by greed, corruption, and indifference of a population of powerless, starving, hungry people. And, you know, there's there are a lot of different dynamics. And if you look at this superficially like a libertarian, you might go, oh, well, free trade, let them work. If it sucks, that's their choice. That, But the reason it sucks is because of government. <clears throat> this is not an example of capitalism. This is an example of imperial corporatism. And because people care more about their personal indulgences, it is, it is a very short-sighted consumerism in America that drives this, where this isn't this doesn't get talked about in Congress, because people don't care. Why don't people care? Because a lot of the manipulation of the conversation in America leads people to care about things that no shit serve the agendas of the mainstream parties anyway. But just one more example. A couple quick crypto stories now that we're done with our international blog before we get to our guest. Louis Marinelli, who has something to say about crypto, will be joining us shortly. NextGov.com, IRS wants tools for cracking crypto wallets. <laughs> No oh, shit. The agency's digital forensics unit wants to tame the cybersecurity research into measured, repeatable, consistent digital forensic processes. Yeah, well, uh, no. The reason we're doing this is so that we can say, go pound sand. Uh, you know, if you want to use crypto with absolute privacy, sorry, none of your shit's going to get in. But we do have some a uh, little quick follow-up. Bad news, you know, on Bitcoin's recent crash. Although, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's bad news. It's just man, part of the progress humanity of uh, Bitcoin goes, you know, parabolic up, down, up, down, but the overall progress. And, you know, it's, it's great to hear the Bitcoin uh, uh, haters. That's, that's all they are. Saying things like, oh, look, Bitcoin, it sucks. It just lost half, half its value. And those of us who get it going, like, yeah, it went from zero to 32,000. Went from zero to 64 and back to 32. And you're going to complain that an asset came out of nowhere, went from zero to $32,000 each, and is now worth how many billions of dollars? Fuck yourself, short sighted bullshit, because that is a bias towards the status quo and towards authority that is, you know, really behind that being expressed. CNBC, though, has this last headline before we get to our guest Bitcoin crash opens door to a tax loophole for investors. Ah, ha, ha. Oh, it has even better. It gets even better. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, and other cryptos have seen prices plunge in recent weeks. These investors can leverage those losses in a way that a typical stock or mutual fund investor can't. <laughs> That's because the so-called wash sale rules don't apply to crypto, according to financial advisors, but there are important caveats. 
So this is for those of you who are doing crypto on the books and worried about paying taxes on it. Guess what? Crypto can help you even pay less than taxes now. There are some new loopholes to exploit. So congratulations to everybody who is able to do that. And to those who are currently buying the dip, buy low, sell high, or buy low and hold until, or hodl rather, uh, until crypto renders all fiat currencies obsolete yes. once and for all. That is what we have to look forward to. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is fellow member of the Cal Exit Congress, Louis Marinelli. He is running for governor of California uh, in this special recall election. Very exciting opportunity opening up. Very exciting that we have a candidate running on the platform of California independence. I think there should be a candidate running on this platform in every governor's race, in every state in the country. Of course, the other parties will never allow it. But part of what makes the California recall special election unique is the same feature that gave us the governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, following the recall of Governor Greg Davis. Hoping to follow in his footsteps with casting perhaps a, a slightly smaller shadow physically. Louis Marinelli also looking to take advantage of this opportunity. But now, now, thanks to his platform, with some serious teeth behind it, presenting the people of California with an opportunity long in the making and long overdue. Louis, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Well, thank you for having me on the program. It's great to be here. First time. All right. Well, hey, Lewis, it's been fun enjoying all of these conversations we've had around Cal Exit and hearing your voice there. But most of my audience doesn't know about you. You're, you, you are a dark horse candidate. What do you want people to know about your personal background before we get into this race? Well, I am, of course, an American citizen. There's a lot of talk about my citizenship because I currently uh, reside in Russia, where my family lives. And so I'd like to point out from the get-go that I am an American citizen, and I am registered to vote in the state of California. And I have not served two terms as governor of California, and I have not <laughs> ever been convicted of financial crimes. So therefore, those are the four qualifications that one needs to be elected governor in California. I meet those qualifications and I am running for governor. Beautiful, beautiful. And I, I think one of the qualifications should be that you get to hang out with Snowden. Are, are you, uh, you know, there is, there is a weird, I, I know you're not like, you're not like going to movies on Fridays for date night with him over there as, as uh, American expats. Uh, <laughs> but there is, there is a connection here. What's the relevance? With Edward Snowden. Well, I mean, Edward Snowden happened to come to Russia by chance. I mean, I believe if I recall his story, he was actually on his way in transit to another destination uh, and he got held up here and he's kind of decided to stay here by necessity more than by choice. Uh, so I guess that's uh, where we depart because I came to Russia intentionally. I mean, I studied Russian at university and my, uh, I'm married to a Russian woman. I have a, a Russian citizen child, and my family's here. And in Moscow, we opened up in 2016 the California Embassy and Culture Center, where we maintain a permanent exhibit on California history and culture. And I welcome uh, Russians. I mean, with the exception during the pandemic, of course, we could not. But uh, when it's open, we welcome Russians to come in. It's kind of like a small museum where we display California history and culture and California values. And so I've been working on that. Aside from that, I'm a kindergarten teacher. There's a lot of talk about how, uh, you know, I, I went to Russia, and so I must be working for Putin, but I'm just a kindergarten teacher. Just a <laughs> kindergarten teacher. All right, well, the, the connection, I, I see a, a slightly deeper connection here, because you both made it, I mean, Snowden made a choice to, uh, you know, be in an American jail, right? Or to be in Russia, essentially. And you have made the choice in a sense to say, like, you know what? I'd rather represent California. And one of the, like, I'm, I'm born and raised from California, uh, also an expat of California, living in Arizona, who very much considers myself a son of California. I you was know, born in San Francisco, 
grew up in the Bay Area, went to college in Claremont, went to boot camp at MCRD San Diego and Camp Pendleton. You know, like I, 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 I'm as connected to California as a home state as anywhere else. And some of the conversations that we have had and presentations that we have seen with CalEx at Congress really underscore the uniqueness and the culture and the fact that, yeah, it, it, California kind of should have its own embassy to Russia. Uh, but if you won, just as if Snowden won his legal battles, you would come back to California and be looking forward to something much better than what Californians experience today. Is that fair? That's pretty that's pretty accurate. I mean, one of the reasons I tell people that why I went to Russia, besides my personal connection to you know my family's here and, and I studied Russian, is the fact that I don't want to live under the American flag. Uh, and as you kind of alluded to in the beginning, an opportunity has presented itself in this upcoming recall election, where if we can declare California to be an independent country, then I don't have to live under the American flag anymore. And I can live in California. And so <laughs> that's the ideal. The ideal is to be able to live in California without living under the American flag. And that's what this campaign is about. Become governor, declare California an independent country, put it in the hands of the legislature to affirm that declaration, and then put it before the people to affirm that affirmation. And then that will uh, remove American legitimacy uh, in terms of how they have dominion over California. Now, before we get into the policy implications of this, are the people of California ready? How is this issue received? Well, I think that, of course, you're never going to have unanimous consent uh, on any topic. But one of the things that Marcus and I, who, you know, Marcus Evans, I started this campaign with Marcus Evans years ago. So we're the co-founders of this movement. Uh, one of the things that we we found was that as we traveled around the state of California, of course, before I went to Russia, uh, we were approached at our tents and our events with people who, of course, California, were saying, of course, California could be its own country. We have the economy, we have the resources, we have uh, the technology, and uh, all the different aspects of the of, of our economy would allow us to be an independent country. So there really wasn't much question about whether or not there's support for the idea out there. Where there's a question is of whether or not it's possible. And people, for some reason or another, believe that uh, seceding from the union is not possible. And so our campaign has been focused on trying to rectify that error and to inform the population that it is possible. And once people believe that it is possible, then I think that there's going to be a massive uh, swelling of support for our campaign. And that's why we're out there talking about things like Texas versus white, which says that a state cannot secede from the union unilaterally, but it says it can secede with the consent of the states. And many people don't know that. And so what I like to say is that Cal exit, when everyone understands that secession is possible, will be the biggest bandwagon the world has ever seen. Because right now we have some supporters and we love our supporters, but there are many more out there who maybe quietly or secretly support the idea, but don't want to come out and say so publicly because they don't want to be associated, for example, with right-wing conservatives from American South. Right. And, I mean, justifiably so. And they don't <laughs> want to seem like they're, they're subscribing to some kind of pipe dream that'll never happen. So once we can demonstrate that this is possible and it can happen, and we continue to talk about California values that we support, then we can get away from those those problems of people thinking that it's not possible or that it's something to do about, you know, the restoration of slavery. Yeah. Yeah. Now to me as a libertarian, as, as that idealist of, of ethics, wanting to see a voluntary society, but even more so as a localist, I believe that the way humanity progresses to a state of greater peace and harmony and quality of life is getting government down to the community level where it's serving people, governments can compete, people have freedom of choice in leaving or being a part of different communities. And so this has like, a, you know, huge intellectual appeal, <clears throat> you know, for an idealist like me. But uh, before, I, I wanted to ask you about all the issues, but now I'm too turned on by this idea. I, I, wa I want you to go into this more. Uh, and, and if you have to put this in terms as a candidate, as an appeal to California, I mean, Californians uh, are not just liberal leftists. They are also 
progressives in the true sense of the world who want to be a part of progress. And if you were elected governor or if some by some other miracle in the next few years, California is able to be the first major global secession movement of this phase in human history, it could be a huge domino. We talk about this in CalExit, uh, in, in CalExit Congress, about this being a global movement with the Scottish independent vote, with Catalonia, with uh, even in California, the Jefferson State Project. We have a liaison from the Texas independence movement as part of the CalExit Congress. So, Lewis, to the Californian voters, come on, man, let's make history. What's your pitch? Well, my pitch is to say this. Look at what happens every four years. We have an election. And for some reason or another, we believe that by electing the opposite party that's currently in power at the moment, things are going to change and get better. And they don't. And we think that eventually, every four years, more and more people will come to the same conclusion that we came to many years ago. And that's that the American system is broken and doesn't serve Californians, doesn't serve California. And if we look at the election, for example, of uh, Donald Trump, you know, everyone was upset, justifiably so, and they waited out four years, and then you know Joe Biden was recently elected, and they thought that, oh, everything will be better now, you know, things are going to improve now, and and have they? Have things improved? Have your has your life, in some drastic way or, or in meaningful way, improved at all ever in your life, because of the acts of the United States government? I would argue that the opposite has happened, that because of the acts of the American government, the federal government, life has become more difficult and more expensive. And so by getting a, a California out of the United States, we can reduce the burden of government in our lives and we can stop California from being a donor state, which is what comes in to the financial uh, side of the story, where we're talking about how uh, California pays more in federal taxes than it receives uh, in federal funding. And if we can keep California's taxes in California, then we can pay for all of the public services that the people of California need and deserve instead of paying for America's military adventures and America's bloated uh, military budget and subsidizing the other states in this country. States, by the way, that hate California values and hate Californians, think that Californians are crazy, uh, loony leftists, and so on and so forth. I mean, why would we be sending our tax dollars to Alabama and Tennessee and other red states uh, to, the, to support the people who hate California. It's kind of like biting the hand that feeds you. So yeah. we take the position well, that it's time to stop paying for other states. We take the position that it's time to stop paying for America's foreign military adventures and that it's time to keep California's taxes in California to reduce the cost of living in California and to rebuild our infrastructure and fully pay for public services. I love your reason. I love your talking points. I love what you're saying, what you cover. I hope you find a way next in this campaign to, to connect with because there's 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 a romantic ideal there's poetry that needs to be written to inspire to connect with that prog that the righteous progressive dynamic of Californians who want to be a part of moving humanity forward. I think that Californians love to make history. I think that Californians love to set a new path forward and make the make a, a new precedent, set the example. And this is another way where we can do that. Because All right. Californians can be the first state in the union to secede from the union if we so choose. All right, Lewis. Mike Freeman on YouTube asks, uh, if California does succeed, secede, how would the trade agreements, military bases, international ports, et cetera, et cetera, happen? Good nuts and bolts question. Sure. Well, this is this is one of the important uh, questions because it, it, it allows us to answer so many other questions. People ask questions about, for example, well, what about the military? What about the water? You know, what about the other resources that we share with the Americans? And this is this is how we answer. We say we're going to sign trade agreements with the Americans, just the way this, the same way that the Americans sign trade agreements with with Canada, with Mexico. I mean, they're going to sign trade agreements with California, and we can sign uh, multinational trade agreements that encompass all of North America. I mean, we had before something called uh, NAFTA, which was uh, North American Free Trade. Uh, agreement. Well, if, if California were a country then, I'm sure maybe California would have joined uh, NASA as a country. Let me, on, on this point, let me, let me ask, as long as you're getting into that, let me ask this in a, a more challenging, pointed way, perhaps. 
Are you going to have a? Are you going to have border checkpoint? Well, you already have a border checkpoint between California and Arizona, right? Are you carrying any fruits and vegetables? Uh, uh, you, you know, uh, <laughs> is is meth a vegetable? No, okay, no, we're good. Uh, yeah, uh, no, uh, that's a terrible joke. But you get my point. You know, uh, what are you actually going to do? Is there going to be a border? How do are you, people from? Yeah, I mean, we just drove from Vegas to L.A. Thousands of people do that every every hour on weekends. You know, how are sure. you going to manage? There's going to be a border. There's going to be a border. But anybody who's an American citizen today will be grandfathered in, and they'll be an American citizen, uh, you know, tomorrow. So if you are an American citizen living in California, and then the day after California becomes an independent country, you're going to continue to be an American citizen, simply living in a foreign country. Kind of like what I'm doing right now. I'm an American citizen living in a foreign country. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to change for the uh, tens of millions of people in California who are American citizens who live in California. By the way, Liz, you still, do you still have to pay American taxes and California state income taxes working in Russia? Well, you know what? The, it's one of the unique things about the United States is that they require their citizens to pay and file taxes even though they work and uh, pay taxes abroad. Now, the, the kind of the good no, side. No, no, no. Of hold on, hold on, Lewis. I got to rephrase. I know you're being political and polite. Let me, let me translate from that sort of status paradigm. No. The American government is the only one whose empire is so successful that its citizens are incapable of making money in a foreign country and keeping it because other governments are so weak in comparison that they cannot protect the sovereignty of commerce in their territory from the American empire. Well, I, I would say certainly that uh, you know this requirement to file taxes and pay taxes uh, while living in a foreign country mostly affects those who earn uh, tremendous amounts of money because there is a certain threshold that uh, you can earn up to where you basically report foreign income and you get a credit for that on your taxes. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm a kindergarten, kindergarten teacher, so I don't obviously don't make that much money. So that kind of a, a, a applies to me where I can simply report how much money I earn and then I, I get a credit for that on the tax uh, on the taxes. So, but you know, there, there are other people who have uh, large lumps of money and they'll end up having to pay you know, American taxes uh, on the, even if it's foreign earned. So, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, if you're wealthy in California and you, you have foreign income and you sometimes pay taxes on foreign income, you don't want to. A lot of Californians are citizens of other countries, uh, a dual citizenship, for example, or residents of other countries, so on and so forth. You know, maybe, maybe an independent California wouldn't have that type of policy. You know, maybe. Wait, are you, are you saying that an independent California would become a tax haven of sorts because you're no longer subsidizing the U.S. federal government's military-industrial complex and wasteful swamp. But no, and I, and I, this is this was like a revelationary for me in in getting involved with Calexa to hear the argument uh, of retort to people saying, "But if California goes independent, it's going to go super liberal, and us libertarians and conservatives in California are going to get swamped." And it's like. No, even if it's more liberal in flavor, you get a way better experience as a taxpayer without subsidizing this hugely wasteful, inefficient thing. So, Lewis, any thoughts on that or this question from Healthy Disrespect on YouTube who writes, if this succeeds, will the people born in Cali but living elsewhere have Cali citizenship? So, like, so in, in my case, I, would, I, would, I have said this before, if California goes independent, uh, I, I will move back. Yeah, so the way that I see this, and actually, to be honest with you, I learned this uh, by living in Russia and looking at what Russia does with uh, citizens of former members of the Soviet Union. As you, as you may know, you know, Russia is a country, but it used to be one country of a union with several other uh, countries called the Soviet Union. And then since they broke apart, you still have uh, you know, all these multiple different countries now, but they all, for some reason or other, want to go to Russia because it's the guess, the most developed of, of the group, I guess. And so Russia has a special process for citizens of Kazakhstan, uh, Ukraine, uh, you know, Tajikistan, and so on and so forth, uh, where these people can apply for Russian citizenship even today under a more simple process. And so I think that's a good strategy for us to embrace in North America, where if California becomes an independent country, Anybody who's a California citizen 
or a resident of California, I guess, would automatically become a citizen of California. Anybody who was born in California would retroactively be given uh, uh, California citizenship. And then I would also extend it to Americans, like in other states, like at one time or another, you know, California was a part of this country and you could have traveled there at your heart's desire. And now all of a sudden it's a separate country. So you need a visa. No, I don't support that. I would say that if you're an American citizen who lives outside of California, that, and you were born in the United States, that you have the right to California citizenship by default, just because you used to be a part of the same country. And then I guess it would fall upon the next generation of Americans, the children of, of, of our children who are born later after California independence to then have to apply for some kind of, uh, you know, documentation to travel to uh, California, just as they would travel to Canada or Mexico. So the answer to the question short, in, in short, anybody born in California would be a California citizen. Anybody who is a resident of California would, would be able to acquire California citizenship and the citizens of the other states in this generation would be automatically eligible to receive California citizenship. All right. We've had some great questions come in on the comments on YouTube. Sorry if we've missed a couple. If you need to get them back, we've got uh, Lewis for about eight more minutes. Want to get some of these in here. UT23881 on YouTube raises this much bigger thorny issue with a very pointed question, a uh, bigger thorny issue of COVID. Would the new country of California require shots to enter? I mean, I can't speak to that simply because that's probably an issue that would be passed by the legislature. I mean, I mean, we're not running for we're not running for dictator here, where we're going to be just unilaterally making decisions, you know, whatever I want. Uh, but I mean, but it's a fair question. So, you know, of course, the governor has to have an opinion on that. The governor would eventually sign or veto uh, that legislation. I'm, I'm not a supporter of mandated vaccination. So I, I believe that along the same lines of, you know, a woman should have the right to choose what she does with her body, uh, that people should have the right to choose what they do with their body. <laughs> and that includes, uh, you know, vaccinations. Uh, personally, I have been vaccinated uh, as a child. I've from time to time gotten a flu shot, for example. I haven't gotten a COVID vaccine. Uh, I've already had COVID-19 and I uh, just haven't gotten the COVID vaccine. I live in Russia and they haven't, I guess, opened it up to foreigners at the moment, the Russian vaccine. I'm not really sure. I'm not so concerned with it. But uh, the point of the matter is, I personally believe that people should have the right to choose what they do with their bodies, that I, I would oppose as governor uh, mandatory vaccines of any kind. And I would uh, encourage the legislature to take up the legislation to determine what kind of requirements visitors need to have uh, you know, because when I come to Russia, for example, I need to have a certificate that says, for example, that I don't have HIV. And that's, uh, when it, as a work, that's, that's a part of Russian legislation that they said. They don't, you know, they have a little bit of an issue here with HIV. Uh, so they make sure that visitors who come uh, for a long term to work in Russia don't have it. And so, you know, I think that the people of California and the legislature would examine what are our public health needs and then make legislation appropriate for that. Maybe it would, you know, maybe it would be COVID-19. Maybe it would be something. I, I, yeah, I, you don't need to get any more into this, Lewis. I think we got some more questions to get to, but I think that's a great answer. I just want to point out to the audience here what I think you're trying to do, which is very righteous to say, oh, I am making my candidacy and what my agenda as governor would be about California independence. And, and based on my principles, I have this position, but in terms of policy and what I would do with the governorship, I would basically hunt that to the legislature and say, that's not what I was elected to do. Let's let the people decide this separately from yeah. my influence as a governor. Yeah, and you exactly. have to walk that line, right? To make sure that you are still mm -hmm holding this core concept of offering the people of California. Exactly. And, and this and this recall election allows me to do exactly that because what for what I want to achieve, if I get elected this year, I'll have one year in office to do that before the next election. I don't need four years to declare California to be an independent country. So if I'm elected this year, I'll have one year to achieve my goal, to achieve my mission of declaring, making a declaration. I can say that. It's something that I say in front of people on TV. It's not going to take me a year to do that. I will make a declaration that says that California declares itself to be an independent country. And then I will push that onto the legislature to say, it's up to you now to affirm that declaration as the representatives of the people of California, or it's up to you to go back home and tell the people of California that you don't deserve 
<laughs> you don't deserve to be an independent country, and you must continue to bend the knee to Washington. I don't think that many representatives in the California legislature are going to want to go back home and tell people that they don't deserve to be an independent country, because I think that everyone accepts the fact that in the in society, people understand that California could do it if it was legal and could do it if it was possible. And if I'm making it possible, then the people will be behind it. All right, uh, Luz, we got just a few minutes. I'm going to try to combine these last few good questions I saw on the screen here. Anthony Ralston on YouTube. What are your thoughts on the Texit movement in Texas? And if they also secede, how would you manage treaties? And then there was a, a two-word question from Clubix13, open borders, and then whoop de doo If that comment is still handy there. Uh, I, I believe it was it was something else about uh, taxes and, and inter international relations as an independent California. So anyway, whatever you have to say, please, about those general topics, those questions, however you want to answer them, and uh, your final thoughts, sir. Sure. Well, one of the partners that we're proud to work with and have worked with even internationally is the Texas uh, nationalist movement and the support for Texas, Texas independence. Uh, we've, we, I personally, in fact, attended a conference with their representative in Moscow, which was an, a, a conference on, uh, you know, multipolar world and the secession movements around the world that was attended by uh, representatives from Texas and California, that's myself, as well as Puerto Rico and some uh, places in, in Europe and Africa as well. So we work closely with them. We support Texas independence. And one of the key reasons why is not that we, we think that you know, Texas policy or Texas mentality is so great that they should be an independent country. But we, we want to keep the peace in North America. We want to get out of each other's hair. And we really believe that the people of California and Texas, if we were not in the same dysfunctional household, could be good friends as independent mm -hmm. countries on the same uh, platform as countries instead of as, as, as states in, the, in a dysfunctional union as countries in the world that, you know, we're not interfering with each other's domestic affairs. We could get along pretty well. And yes. so that's that's why we, we support those uh, the movement in Texas. As for the other question, uh, I forget what it was. Can you repeat what it was? Open borders question mark. Open borders. So I uh, I don't support open borders in the context that you know people can just freely move uh, in to California without some kind of a checkpoint. We want to know who's here. Uh, I believe that. Uh, people should be able to freely come to California. So I wouldn't, you know, support establishing some kind of strict visa regime. I mean, I know how that is because I live in Russia and I know how difficult it is to, you know, apply for a visa to just to go and see your family <laughs> who lives in Russia. <laughs> so I've gone through that personally to understand the, the way that having to ask for permission to go see loved ones in another country can be difficult and frustrating. So I certainly would not be an advocate of doing that. Uh, but having that said, I still believe that there should be borders and there should be some kind of process for crossing that border. And uh, we need to be compassionate about it. And but we also need to be, uh, you know, fair and, and logical about it and safe. It's also a public so safety. The question from whoop de doo on YouTube. Thank you for that. was about trade. And isn't this trade agreement just about taxes and exports like what's already happening? Just different ratios in California's benefit. And I think, like, yeah, yeah, that's part of the point is that the more localized trade is managed, the more it is in the local interest of local people, which is like, I well, definitely, yeah. all people are local, all people live in one place at a time we're all local, right? Uh, but no, it's funny, California, having gone virtual with everything in the uh, COVID hysteria, they can't really criticize you for not being there in person. Why not run for governor remotely and do the right thing for California? Any, uh, any thoughts on that issue of trade being uh, much more in the benefit of, of California and managed by Californians as opposed to influenced by the feds? Yeah, definitely. Well, well, California is, in general, such a diverse population and society that d we should be able to make our own policy decisions. We are a distinct society. So when it comes to things like trade, why should we defer to diplomats in Washington, 3,000 miles away, to decide you know, how we're going to sell peanuts and, and fruits and vegetables out of California. We right. should be making those decisions because we know what our supply uh, is. We know our farmers. We know, you know, and it's not just about uh, agriculture. We also have other things that we produce in California that, that we could sell overseas. The point is that Californians should be just making the decision about where California products are sold and, and, and what the terms of those uh, trade deals should be. I know that Californians have 
you know, we, we have different values when it comes to things like protecting workers, you know, over, overseas locations and, and, and a host of other issues that Californians would want to kind of, uh, you know, have a say in determining these trade deals. And I think that when we defer to Washington, it really depends upon who's the president of the United States at the time. And that president may or may not be, you know, sympathetic to California values. So long story short, Californians should be the ones governing California. And, and that includes when we're talking about trade deals. Trade deals, we can decide with whom we're going to trade and what those trade deals will entail. And we'll do a better job of doing it. Awesome. Loomis, thank you so much for joining us this morning. The website is calexitgovernor.com. Great URL there. Calexitgovernor.com. All yeah, right. come on over our, our, our website. You can read a little bit more about me and also about our campaign. And uh, we look forward to this election because it'll be the first time in history that the people of California will actually be able to walk into a ballot box and cast a ballot that represents a, a vote for independence. It's never happened before up until now. Absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you for giving Californians and thanks for having me on the show myself in this sense as a California voter with this opportunity. All right. All right. Let's check in with Ed, Ed Vallejo co-host. How you doing, brother? What do we have for our uh, comment contest? Any, any standout leaders right now? It's a toss up between euphemisms for double speak or best reason for an insurrection. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is this might be the producers club defending itself again it's getting very exclusive if only producer club members are winning these contests if you're watching and you're not in the producers club win today by getting meta with ed what would be the best comment contest to see on ed versus the man put it in the comments that's our comment contest today and i think if a non-producers club member wins this one you will have won a very special meta membership and the producers love to be able to bring that kind of unique meta-analysis to the conversation, Adam versus the man. Ed, we're going to skim through the headlines before we get to our next guest. Any other thoughts? No, it's just uh, our our people are witty. I mean, our people are witty. They are. They're, and they're sharp, too. They're sharp on the questions. They know what's going on. I like these people, Adam. Hey, and according to Joey, someone signed up to our Patreon is our latest patron right now. Live Kelly soon. King. Thank you, Miss Kelly King. All right. Welcome to the club. I don't oh, was enough to join the club. Oh. Right. And if you don't, just in case anybody, if you've won a contest in the past and never followed through, producer at the Freedom Line for all such notes. Ed, we'll be back in a few minutes to check in with you for the winner. All right. The right scoop.com. Breaking. James O'Keefe exposes how Facebook is censoring vaccine hesitancy on global scale. I'm like, I'm, yeah, I'm really glad O'Keefe is out there doing this stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, someone, someone's there to prove it. I kind of be like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> but no, there. this is not just some, what, what, what I think is cool about this story, we're not going to get too far into it being short, short on time to get through our stack today. Uh, it, it, it's that it's not just some, benign censorship run amok that they know kind of tilts the conversation in their favor. It's deliberate targeting of vaccine hesitancy. And according to the story, two whistleblowers came forward to Project Veritas to expose this because they were so bothered by it. And it's not just their word against Facebook. They have the insider documents to back it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, two Facebook insiders. This is for, quoting Project Veritas now, uh, who, who, according to uh, the right scoop, appears to be uh, making a great effort to hide the identities of these whistleblowers. Two Facebook insiders have come forward with internal company documents detailing a plan to curb vaccine hesitancy on a global scale. The stated goal is features to drastically reduce user exposure to VH comments. Another aim of the program is to force a decrease and other engagements of VH comments, including create likes, reports, and replies. It was such a shocking revelation that it moved not just one, but two whistleblowers to come forward to Project Veritas so the public could be made aware of this plan to stifle free speech. Now, I mean, I we've been talking about this since the beginning of COVID. I just hope this now gets 
people to the point where they question what is is apparent herd mentality. You know, it, it's not just herd mentality. It's it's kind of rational, right? For most people to outsource their thinking on certain things to the community. Oh, what are people are doing this? Well, if everybody's doing this, I'm going to go along with the herd. And the thing is you can make, manipulate the herd all to move in, in one direction if you can make everybody in the herd think that everybody else is already moving in that direction. And that's what this is about with the vaccine hesitancy. It's creating that herd mentality and it, it is really disgusting the blatant forms of censorship and manipulation that's being used to achieve that. I hope they've gone too far. I hope they have gone too far with COVID to the point where people realize this and go, well, just because everybody on Facebook is doing it, like, get off Facebook, you know, and I don't mean like just never touch it, but don't engage with that toxic conversation and don't uh, turn to it or, or, or allow your conversation to be manipulated. I mean, think about it. You go, oh, well, Facebook is making this awesome conversation between me and my friends happen. Well, it's like if they hosted a party and around a campfire, everybody gets to talk, except if you said something the host of the campfire doesn't like, they just put a black bag over your head and nobody else gets to hear you. And you don't even know that you're talking into the void. They're just hiding you from other people's feeds. It, 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 this is so fundamentally toxic. Let's take away this tool from them to manipulate the conversation. If you're going to engage with any social media platform and give it your time and attention and engagement, you know, use it as a way to get content, like from from people like us, from from outlets for news that you're or whatever information that you trust. Uh, but but don't let them control your feed. Don't let them control your conversation. I mean, don't even read comments. These are things you can't even read comments on Facebook. Not all of them. No, no, you can't. No, no, no. I'm saying, Joey, you cannot read comments on Facebook because it's toxic. Like, for the same reason, you can't. No, no, here, here. Yeah. You can't. What I would say before is you can't look at your Facebook feed and expect it to be an honest, unbiased, unmanipulated by political agenda kind of conversation. No. Now we know it's so fucking toxic. You can't even read the comments on your own posts that's without thinking one. that's being censored and manipulated. Yeah. I had to cover that one. Um, Mirror.co.uk. Couple get married. So we have a couple, we have a couple COVID, not COVID stories. Couple get married on plane midair with 161 guests to avoid COVID restrictions. <laughs> I love it, right? Because in India, they're saying, you could only get 50 people in a room. This is like, hey, government, really? This is a travel is important. Air travel with corporate airlines. That's okay to risk your life with COVID for. But a wedding, community, co committing yourself to another human being in front of friends and family and God and community. You're like, oh, yeah, that's not important. So they said, fuck you. We're having our wedding on a plane. So you get 161 people on a plane. <laughs> Love it. Flea market mutt. Uh, COVID did not kill Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's basically the story. Uh, did they get away with it? Police are reportedly looking into the matter and deciding whether or not to launch an investigation. Wow. All right. Wow. Uh, shit hits the fan plan. SHTFplan.com. Oxford secretly used millions of patient cell phone data for vaccine mobility study. And this is we've, something we've seen from a number of of mainstream sources as well coming out in England. People very upset about this uh, in a flagrant violation of patients' medical privacy that has just come to light. The British government is admitted to collecting and using smartphone data to analyze their activity without disclosing it as part of a vaccination study. Yeah. Now we have a series of stories. Uh, we might come back to this, but we have our guests. So I'm just going to skim these headlines real quick, let you know that they're in the notes. Uh, I, I called this section. Uh, wait, what did I call it? Where, 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 where did I, where did I, where, where my notes? Well, uh, the mood in America. The mood in America. You guys ready for the mood in America? In seven headlines. Thehill.com. U.S. sees startling rise in anti-Semitic attacks. Also, a rise in perceived anti-Semitic attacks. CBS SF Bay Area fears arise as burglaries in San Francisco soar. Yes, it is. As we told you, it was going to be a socialist paradise. From cron.com, 
from the Washington Post. A high school edited yearbook photos to hide girls' chests. Students and parents are furious. Yes. The modesty police came out with pixelated blurs over tops of high school girls that were okay on photo day, but not when it came time to publish the yearbook. Yeah, the state of Puritanism in America. Also from the Hill.com, NFL launching review after former coach said he was told he was not the right minority during an interview. He was Asian. We wanted a black dude. Now, I, I don't know how this went down. Eugene Chong, who is of Korean descent, told the Boston Globe that he was interviewing for a job as an assistant coach when an unnamed staff member for the unidentified team told him, well, you're not, you're really not a minority. <laughs> So I was like, what do you mean I'm not a minority? And he was told, you are not the right minority we're looking for. <laughs> These are not the minorities you are looking for. Get it from me on screen. These are not the minorities you are looking for. These minorities are not as effective in identity politics pandering. How dare you, you Asian? Didn't you know that this job slot was reserved for a black man? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to America 2021. I don't think this was real though. I think he might have made this up. They could have got like a black Whatever. Asian guy. It's good, good way to call it. You're you're an Asian NFL coach. You want to make some shit up to call attention? Could be that. I don't know. I don't really care. Uh, flea market and what? Kazar are Eastern European, not Semitic. Oh yeah, you talking about types of Jews here? All right. Uh, LA Times at Yahoo.com. California's highest in the nation. Gas taxes are rising, but promised repairs are lagging. Oh really? I told you California was a socialist paradise. Uh, in California, roads fix you. <laughs> <laughs> Wall Street Journal with this headline, from FBI to the Wonder Years, TV networks bet on more franchises reboots. Either nostalgia is big right now, or these are dying media. I think it's both. And in Alabama, we covered the story yesterday at NPR. We don't have time to get into it more as I wanted to today. But Alabama will not allow yoga in its public schools, but students can't say, namaste. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to protect America's yeah. youth. Parents doing such a good job through the PTAs. All right. that Those are our headlines for today. And I'm very excited now to get to our second guest. Our next guest is Libertarian Party activist Justin O'Donnell, longtime libertarian activist, well-known figure within the party, also a veteran who I've interviewed about his military experiences in some very poignant ways uh, with, with how 9-11 was a turning point for him. Very beautiful what he's had to say about that in the past and leveraging that experience to effective libertarian messaging. Uh, he's run for a number of offices, uh, former member of the Libertarian National Committee even, a candidate for U.S. Senate, and he's now on the board of directors of an agorist nonprofit uh, at, known as The Quill. And this is, uh, he's coming today. I don't know if there's anything else you want to plug in your arsenal of activism here, <laughs> Justin, but uh, Justin is coming to, to us today to talk about what's going on with this very important institution within the libertarian movement, the Free State Project in Manchester, the Quill. Justin, welcome back to Adam versus the Man. How you doing, brother? Hey, thanks for having me, Adam. Always good to come. Well, uh, anything else you want to talk about or you want to just jump right into what's going on with the Quill here? I, I mean, the Quill is our big push. The Quill is my big mission now. Um, I have uh, recently taken a step back from the LP, um, not not for any reason other than uh, I'm exhausted, my own burnout with it, and wanting to see people other than the old guard move the LP into the next uh, next generation. And uh, recently with LPNH, at least, we had a huge influx of new membership, a huge influx of motivated people who wanted to take over. So I've taken the opportunity to let them. Uh, let them get their legs under them while I move on to working with community projects and nonprofits and um making uh, liberty win in ways other than politics as well. All right. So I know the quill personally from, yep. <laughs> uh, geez, how many times have I been to the quill? Probably but, over a dozen. I've spoken at at least two Adam Kokesh book tour events at the quill. <laughs> Um, I've gotten stoned in the basement. Oh, wait, am I allowed to say that? There's something. Yeah. So something great. Some I mean, great story about it, Adam. My first time ever at the Quill, you brought me. 
<laughs> so, it was before I moved to New Hampshire. I still lived in Massachusetts, and you were up in New England. And I was hanging out with you for the weekend. We came up to Manchester for your event, and we I remember getting in an argument with the Domino's delivery driver across the street from the quill. And you were you were talking to him about Rod Paul, and he was all aboard everything about it. And you said, "Well, why don't you come hang out at the quill with us?" And his response is like, "No, nah, that's where the crazy people hang out." And just <laughs> <laughs> so, that was my first introduction to the quill. <laughs> well, I, I should say that the quill is a very unique community center and organization. And I think I think I'm pretty safe to joke about getting stoned in the basement at this point. But I say that with a little bit of oh shit hesitancy because there really is a, a private nature to this club as well as a public service and activism component. Can you talk a little bit about what that is, the balance in the organization around that? Yeah, so, so it is a private club. It is a members-driven social club. Um, we're, we're in the process of reorganizing uh, the board of the Quill itself. I'm on the board of the nonprofit trying to uh, purchase the building and help expand into a full-blown fraternal order, not just a single social club. Um, what we're right now, it's membership-driven. People uh, join, you pay your monthly dues, you get 24-hour access. Uh, we have a party space, a dance floor, a bar in the basement, a uh, member's fridges, member's amenities, but we also host public events like community agorist market days uh, where uh, anybody who has a small home business in the community can come set up a booth and sell what they're selling. Um, Emily uh, Smith and Neil Smith of Bardo Farm out in Western New Hampshire come and sell their CSAs and their meat shares at our agorist markets. Other people help sell their uh, homemade soaps and other things that aren't really big with business licensing to come just do it as a community, as well as our new movers parties. Every month we host a big party and a potluck dinner uh, to welcome all the new movers of the Free State Project to uh, the community and get to know each other. And the Quill has really become a cornerstone and a foundation of the Liberty community in New Hampshire. Um, even though it is a private members only club, I don't know many people who live in Southern New Hampshire who are involved in the libertarian movement who haven't been guested, who haven't been in there, who, who couldn't become a member if they didn't, if they wanted to. Um, and, and it's really become the focus, especially in the past year with the COVID lockdowns, with restaurants being closed, with uh, everything to do socially being closed. For a long time last summer, we were hosting weekly big potluck dinners where myself and a few other people who cook a lot were using the kitchen facilities of the Quill to prepare massive meals. And we'd have 30 to 50 people a week showing up for a sit-down community dinner at our community center uh, when the government was telling us we weren't allowed to have two people in a home together. Um, and, and so, like, the purveyance being open 365, seven days a week, the uh nonstop for the past 10 years, even through the lockdowns, it has really become something that I, I believe is important to the continuation of the community. It's important to what we've done as a community. Um, and it's something I want to see expand. Uh, and right now we got presented with the perfect opportunity to push for that expansion because the owner of the building uh, has had some circumstances change in his life and he has had to move to sell the building that we're renting. Uh, so right now we are fundraising to purchase that building from him. He's holding it off the market. He wants to give us the first chance to buy it. He is a friendly, he is a member of the Liberty community himself. He doesn't live in New Hampshire. He lives out of state, but he is, wants to give us the first opportunity to preserve what we have there uh, with the history of the building and the history of the community. And then we've so we've established an organization to fundraise. Uh, we have a GoFundMe up. Uh, we're currently at. Yeah, I was I was about to say, man, you're like you're you 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 did someone give you my questions in advance? You're just <laughs> yeah. So save the quill is the name of yep. the GoFundMe, Jim. Can you get that up on screen if you look for yep. save the quill exclamation mark on GoFundMe.com? You can find that. And, and Justin, what I wanted to point out here yep. is not only is this like a, a, a major infrastructure investment for an organization with people in it, running it, who have proven themselves over the years to be a reliable, I mean, as reliable as you can get with an organization in the freedom movement with a nonprofit, making a major investment. Your goal is $600,000. 
and we oh, you got to go fund me for 600K. There, you guys are $92,170 uh, of the way there already. So like, this is already a yeah. huge successful fundraising effort. I hope that puts you in a position already to leverage something in this uh, sale of the building one way or another. And I'm looking at your donations. They're, they're all like a thousand dollars plus. And I just say that to, to point out not only that this is a serious effort, but for people who want to make that kind of investment, uh, there are, there are, a, there are really good perks with this, especially if you live, you know, within driving distance of Manchester or a day's drive, you know, so Justin, uh, I, I want you to, to end here. If, if you can take a few minutes, make the full pitch, you know, really, why should someone chip in a thousand dollars aside from everything we've laid out about this being a valuable activism and a good investment to support? What, what do they get? Why should people donate right now to support this GoFundMe? Right. So what we have done, because we wanted to make this a very unique libertarian fundraiser, something that speaks to our community as well as providing an incentive. So to incentivize large donations of $1,000 mm -hmm. plus, we have actually minted a uh, SLP token on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain, a unique cryptocurrency called the Quill token. Uh, for every $1,000 donated, we will be issuing out a Quill token to a beneficiary because we didn't want to make this just a straight donation because some people need to be incentivized and these quill tokens uh, are something we will be purchasing back at a rate of eleven hundred dollars a quill token in the future on a quarterly basis because the building we're purchasing actually has income it, it has four apartments upstairs that generate monthly rental income and we're as a nonprofit, we can't just hold profits so we're going to be using that money to purchase back uh the quill tokens that are purchased uh, to help fund the purchase of the building. And so that gives people an incentive to get a recovery on their donation while helping us up front. But there's also other things you can do with those quill tokens. For five quill tokens, the Fraternal Order of Porcupines so, is oh, selling... Oh, hold on, hold on. Yep. I, I, Justin, I want to point this out because yep. this, is, this is no longer really a donation when you're when you're really re-incentivizing it this way. It's, it's, it's actually directly an investment. And you're saying no. instead of instead of taking the risk of a regular investment, you're entrusting that risk with an activist organization and uh, with with this, uh, you know, guaranteed return and, you know, guaranteed as much as anything. Right. Of a return of 10 percent, even without interest on a future date. That's that's really unique. And I want to point that out, not just that that's unique about this deal, but about a lot of what the team at the Quill brings to their activism as a matter of living agorism. So they're not trying to oversell this and be like, invest in the quill. No, there's donate, donate a thousand, you'll get a token. And hey, there's a pretty good chance you're going to make money on this, right? Is that is that a fair summary? Right. And some people don't want to make money. Some people just want to do the straight donation because of how much important it is to them. And so we're some people have already returned their tokens and not taken any money. Some people uh, have already exchanged their tokens. They've purchased five or more and exchanged them for a lifetime membership at the Quill. Um, because right now the going rate is $5,000 for a lifetime membership once you get the vouchers from community members. And But we don't want to disincentivize small donations either. The Quill tokens are only available to large donations $1,000 up. But we every $5, every $10, every $30 does help. It helps push us towards that goal. Um, and so what we're trying to do is come up with more ways to incentivize those small donations as well, especially to people who may not live in Southern New Hampshire, people who might be interested in the Free State Project and seeing the libertarian community succeed long term, uh, but aren't directly involved. And to that end, uh, we, we came to a quick decision last night, myself and I'm sure, you know, William Kostrick uh, had the idea, Adam, we want to pitch something to your fans specifically. Anybody who donates small donations in the GoFundMe and leaves a comment with Adam versus the man or Adam Kokesh, if we reach $5,000 there, we want to give you a lifetime membership at the Quill. That would be my dream, man. It's it's always so. been an honor to be a guest and to have my name on that list, uh, even, even just for that. But to have a home and to be a part of that community and, and a bug out space in that part yep. of the country, be able to use it when I'm there and for tours, man, that would mean a lot. And and it really is 
beautiful what you're doing. I very much appreciate this opportunity. So for anybody in my my audience, I was hoping to say, hey, chip in 5K and get an extra membership for me. <laughs> so thank you, Justin, for making yep. that way easier for my <laughs> audience here uh, to, to help sponsor an Adam Kokesh membership at the Quill. Uh, but regardless of what happens with this, um, I know that the community there is very strong. We'll keep going. I'm always excited to support y'all. Uh, actively working in the free state and the free state project. Yeah. And I mean, the biggest, the biggest reason, like we want to do this now, like it's the really perfect timing. Um, especially when I talk about expanding the quill beyond just owning the building since the last time you've been here, another club has popped up. The quill is not the only club in New Hampshire anymore. There's another club called the shell out on the seacoast out in, uh, Do uh, out in Rollinsford. And what our plan is the moment we get the pr building purchased and have an income generating property, we want to incorporate the shell as lodge number two of the fraternal order of the porcupines. And then mm -hmm. we have a group already willing to go to start lodge number three in Maine. And then I've heard a pitch from our friend AJ Holding, but maybe lodge number four on your compound in Arizona. Yes, <laughs> yes. I would be honored to be uh to be able to do something like that. And I see that yes, what you have done and uh it, it does take time and patience mm -hmm. and commitment to build communities and institutions but then they can hit critical mass and and uh if you guys pull this off to the full degree that you have laid out here it is going to be a major major leveling up long in the making so congratulations on getting to this point good luck on all your continued work and thank you for joining us today Justin. Hey, thank you for all the help and support over the years adam good job <laughs> All right, let's check in with co-host Ed. Who's the winner of our contest today? Adam, we're about out of time, so I'll make it quick. We have a new person. Ha, ha, ha. Last minute entry. Colette, comment contest, what does freedom mean to you? Colette, is Colette a member? Did she win? Has Colette won? I know she's she's weighing in from across the pond. I can't remember if she's actually won. She's not in the I don't know, but if she hasn't, she's in now. Going that much more international this morning. Thank you very much. And thank you, Colette. Thank you to everybody who commented. Any final thoughts today, Mr. Vallejo? That's it, buddy. Uh, life is great. All right. To producer Jim. Producer Notes, take us on. What's going on? Join our public Telegram channel right there. You can get there. It'll bring you to the Patreon to get you the private producers club. Uh, Adam vs. The Man store is going to be awesome. Don't you forget, you'll get 15% off. The Cigar Federation gets 10% off with promo code ADAM10. Uh, Instagram is at the Garden of Freedom. The Crypto 6 still needs your help. And the GoGreenEnergyOnline.com is the best do-it-yourself website for off-grid. So thank you very much, Jim, for good news and history from goodnewsnetwork.org today. Um, Adam, you got to shave the head, bro. That's Claudia Yoshi. One, no. 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 No, I'm going full blown hippie, man. I'm growing this thing down in my butt. All right. Uh, from goodnewsnetwork.org for this day in history, May 25th, we have some bad news that Good News seems to have, uh, the, the Good News Network seems to have, have, have confused. It was on this day in 1787 that delegates, convened a constitutional convention in Philadelphia to write a new constitution for the United States with George Washington presiding. The reason that's bad news is that that was actually part of a coup against the old constitution, a new constitution, not, not to write a constitution, a new constitution, because before that, there were the Articles of Confederation, a voluntary agreement between allegedly sovereign territories, states in a union, not subsidiary units of an empire. So with that, the Constitutional Convention of 1787, it's not good news to be celebrated, but merely the formalization of the new authority created, strong-armed into place to overthrow the Articles of Confederation to institute a new, stronger central authority to collect taxes and to start a central bank to fund a standing army and pervert that which it means to be American. But we do have some genuine good news because it was on this day in 1977 
That's right. On this day in 1977, 44 years ago today, Star Wars, the film that heralded a new era for special effects for fantasy adventure movies, was released. Created by George Lucas, the Star Wars franchise became a worldwide pop culture phenomena through the merchandising of charismatic of charismatic Sega. Yeah, the film was nominated for 11 Academy Awards and won seven, including Best Original Score by John Williams. And with that, thank you so much for joining us on Anna vs. the Man. We'll see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific. Mwah. Peace and love, y'all. Choose happiness and be excellent to each other.